Hi, um, welcome to my shed <laughs> in my garden in Northumberland, which is where I'm working at the moment. Um, I'm Caroline Bilton and I am the EEF content specialist for literacy. Um, yeah, a real privilege that is. I had considered putting on this slide a tiny little ticket of a, uh, a picture of a golden ticket because I often have a sort of recurring thought that that is what happened when I came out of the classroom after 30 years as a class teacher, assistant head, English lead, pupil premium champion, behave, lead for behaviour, lead for um, parental engagement. The list was quite long, as any other primary colleague will completely understand, often dinner lady, of course, as well, whatever was needed of me. And I do often think to myself, it's a bit like I'm Charlie Bucket and I got that little golden ticket not to come out of the classroom because actually I miss being with the children, particularly at this time. I feel really, really conflicted by the fact that I'm not there in the classroom supporting my colleagues and the children in a school that I know very, very well, having taught there for the last 10 years. But because the opportunity to work within the EEF, to develop my understanding of evidence, to support my understanding in terms of what my experience tells me, what I know works well and the evidence that supports that is, is an incredible privilege. So yeah, I didn't put my golden ticket on, but I feel like I've got one. Okay, so um, in this presentation, I want to talk to you about reading. Um, I want to talk to you about the significance of developing children as strategic readers and the significance of that in relation, relation to this slide in terms of our disadvantaged children. So just to give you a little bit more context about myself, I've taught across Northumberland in some of or perhaps the most deprived areas of Northumberland. Um, so I have lots of experience of what works well in the classroom. Um, worked within North Tyneside in some very, very difficult, very challenging circumstances there and in Newcastle as well. Worked as an SLE in those circumstances and, and various other roles. So my understanding of what, what challenges we're facing when we're working with our most disadvantaged children, I hope, in terms of experience is, is, is pretty significant. Um, and this this diagram, which I see, you know, obviously in lots of our uh, materials that we, we work with, with when we're working with schools, it's just that fire in my belly, you know, the unfairness of it. And I really want to unpack a little bit within this presentation, within the time that I've got, what we can do about that, what we can do about that ever increasing gap, what it is that we can do as as practitioners to mitigate it in some way and particularly I suppose as our children come back to us after long periods of time that they haven't been in the classroom what it is we can focus on um, within the parameters of all that we'll be working on to support children's social and emotional well-being hugely obviously significant I mean any primary class teacher will tell you that any work that we're doing around reading will be wrapped up within all of that work on relationships and social and emotional well-being and self-regulation everything wraps around the core business of how we can really work on on this gap and do something significant to mitigate it so I want to talk to you about reading and the role that it plays within that we know that reading matters i know i i see that every in every class with every child i've taught that reading matters to all children across the board it matters most significantly when you unlock the doors of reading comprehension to the most disadvantaged children and i really want to talk about that this morning and what it is that brings children to us in the classroom with the different experiences that we can we can work to um, to support and guide children through. So it matters. It matters for so many reasons. It matters for their social and emotional well being, for their for, for obviously you know it, it's it's more important than anything in terms of their 
uh, cognitive development, to be able to read, to read with the joy of understanding is a, a significant factor in, in so many different ways. The challenge for us, though, as teachers is that it's complex and it's more complex than we've been led to believe, I think, recently. So I did a four year degree to be a primary school teacher. And I honestly think I could write on the side of one page the specific guidance I was given to be a, to be a teacher of reading. And I've taught from reception to year six. And it was very limited. Everything that I know about the complexity of teaching reading is self-taught. It's, it's what I've been hungry to find out because I've wanted the best for my children. And I think the challenge for us as teachers is that's perhaps not a unique experience. That's possibly replicated in lots of you who are hopefully watching this. And then more recently, it's been simplified, I think, to when you teach reading, we're teaching it through phonics. So there's been lots and lots of training around the teaching of phonics. But reading matters not because it's a simple process of decoding. Reading matters because it unlocks an emotional response to a text, which in turn develops a real eagerness to, to connect with books. So we can't just see it as a, oh, I can get the words right on the page. Reading matters because I can get the words right because that gives me an understanding of what this author was trying to tell me. So it's not just as simple as the decoding that we've all been given lots and lots of training in. It's more complex because it involves comprehension as well. And what the national curriculum tells us is that we teach decoding and we need to teach comprehension as well, and that the two must be taught explicitly and the two must be taught in that they're, they're taught in different ways. So it's really important that we understand the complexity of it. And I suppose that we understand the limitations of how we've been trained through no fault of our own, that it's been simplified. And I suppose what I want to do is just unpack a little bit in the in, in the time we've got um, about that complexity. Yeah. So <laughs> to, to, to rewind, I want to think about the children that come to us in our classrooms. Um, love this photograph. This is a photograph of Simon, my husband, and my two children, taken a while ago. It's looking a bit dated, that photograph. Um, and it's Jonathan and Olivia wrapped up in their, the arms of their dad, reading a book about dinosaurs. You can see that Johnny is the most excited it's possible to be um, because he adored dinosaurs. And that's how my kids were brought up. You know, uh, we're both teachers. Uh, Simon teaches much older kids. He actually teaches them carpentry and joinery. <laughs> so didn't know much about dinosaurs. Um, but we both value and have valued the joy of reading. Um, so this is the environment that my kids were brought up in. Before they could read themselves, they were read to. They were read to from the tiniest age. So they were constantly developing their vocabulary. They were constantly developing their listening comprehension. So if we think about what reading sits on, it sits on, it's like a boat at sea. <laughs> the sea is that listening comprehension and that language, all of those, those factors that are allowing that boat to float when the children get to school. So they had all of that beautifully um, supportive environment, not always beautifully supportive, but you know, um, that supportive environment to ensure that they were able to go very easily into school. And as you would perhaps expect, learn to read very quickly and easily. In fact, my daughter, I think at about that age, stamped her foot and said, why am I the only person who can't read in this family? She was about three and was very determined, even though I, I didn't intervene too much in the teaching of, of other than reading to the children. I didn't intervene with school. You know, that was was their job. She, she, that hunger for it, that expectation to be able to read was defining. 
And I suppose what that meant for my kids, for, for, for lots and lots of children who come into school, is that they go into school ready to be a strategic reader. And what an amazing start they've been given to, to, to be that strategic reader. And a strategic reader does some really, really important things when they meet those texts in school. So I have there The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, one of my most favourite books. Beautiful, beautiful, perfect for reading year two, year three, year four. Some very challenging themes within it, but beautifully told. So let's imagine um, this you know, the, the, the children who've come, they've floated on that sea of talk, of listening comprehension, of messages being constantly sent about the joy and almost an expectation. Of course, you should go to school and you should love reading and you should be you should be asking questions and and expect to understand and enjoy reading. So and, and that's exactly what they do when they come to school. Those children that come to us with that home literacy environment that set them up so beautifully. They look at the front cover of a book and they ask questions. Oh, I wonder, you know, I wonder why, how can that little rabbit talk? I wonder about that house. And they're already beginning to activate their prior knowledge. So they're looking at the front cover and they're questioning, I wonder what period in history, even very, very young children making some connections with their, their, their prior knowledge, making some connections with other books that they've read, making some connections with the real world. Oh, you know, I know somebody who lives in a house like that. So lots of excited questions and links being made just by looking at that front cover. They'll also be very instinctively our strategic readers who've come to us from this really, really rich literacy home environment they're already making predictions they're already suggesting and even if it's an inner monologue they're doing this if the teacher asks them they're going to be the first first to give us their their predictions about what's going to happen in the story they've had a wealth of other books about little toy rabbits or or whatever other links they've made they have so much to draw on that they can be prepared just before the book's even opened to undertake all of these different strategies. And then whilst we're reading to these children, wow, they are doing so many important things. They're constantly checking, oh, I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure I understand some of the science in this. You know, that incredible, this is a beautiful, beautiful book. I absolutely love this book. A gorgeous little girl, big brother, constantly on, a, on his phone. Little girl, constantly looking up to the stars. And our strategic reader is so interested in the science in that and asking questions. Do I understand where the stars are? Do I understand what an astronaut is? So there's lots of incredible questions being generated as we're reading throughout the reading. They're constantly making, can, oh, I saw something on TV about that yesterday. I, I, can, I can constantly connect with my understanding of other books that I've read. So when I talk about um, inferences within the text and globally, I mean, because they're able to link to points further back in the text, oh, and that's developed in this way and the characters have developed and then beyond it, their mental models that they're making as they're reading the book come alive as they're read to. They can visualise all of the, 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 the talk and the discussion within the book feels comfortable. They are our strategic reader. They have come to us floating on that sea of, of, of wealth of experience. Whilst we're reading to them, they're also updating and making new predictions. Ah, I didn't think it was going to happen like that. Now I have to rethink where I thought this was going. And they're so, you know, that, that confidence to do that is powerful and they're able to do it without, without too much of a challenge. So then we come to the strategic reader at the end of the book. Um, 
The book I've chosen just as an example to be here is The Journey by, as you can see, by Francesca Sana. Um, really powerful read this one. Um, definitely recommend this. We, we explored this quite significantly in year six. Um, and yes, that strategic reader as they come to the end of a book, this book in particular required and requires when reading a lot of clarification of understanding. I need to go back through this and check it. And remember our strategic reader has almost that sense of entitlement. I wouldn't leave a book if I didn't understand it. I, I, I actually have this hunger there because that's what, that that's, it, it's right there instinctively in me to go back and to clarify my understanding within the text. So this is what our strategic reader does. We, we, we come to the end of one read, they will revisit and clarify and expect to understand. Um, they'll go back and think, ah, oh, do you know what? That prediction I made when I look at the front of this and there's so, you know, those dark hands coming out of the, of the, of the forest there, which, um, I, do you know what? I thought that I didn't think that was going to be as it was within the story. And I can look back and see how that developed. And then to have further questions. I've read that. It's ignited a spark in me. And now I've got lots of questions about other things around what happened within this book. So that, that they're all firing away at the end of the book. There's a real you know, almost like a, a, a pan of popcorn got to the end and that's just not the end for me. I want to go back and check something. I want to check that up where my, my predictions went. I want to go back to my questions. I want to ask more questions. And also within their own monitoring of their own reading, you know, how, how was that for me? How well did I, did I behave? Did I work as a reader? So that all that that that's that you know the finality of closing a book if i think of that myself i close a book but it never ever ends there all the books i read do fire away in my mind and the questions continue and they stay alive in my head because the next book i open i make a link to that previous book and that's what our strategic reader is doing um in a really important and powerful way so we've been on a journey. Um, we've been on a journey as a strategic reader. We've seen what that wealth of experience has given the children who come to school to us in our classes with that capacity to go through that process when we're reading a book. We know what they do at the beginning of the book. We know what they're doing during the book and we can see what they're doing at the end of a book. But then the question comes, if we go back to, 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 to that sense of where disadvantage lies and reading matters, we come back to the, to the most, I suppose, significant question within all of this, and that is, what happens if I haven't floated to school on that sea of literacy experience? What happens if that hasn't been my experience? Who's going to do something about that? And of course, it's us. It's, it's, it's the teachers in the classroom. And really significantly, the answers to that don't lie. Well, they don't lie. In, in, in their entirety in teaching children the ability to decode. And it, it's where the question of children developing as, as in their ability to decode, but also in their ability to comprehend the two working together is so important and I feel so passionately about, I feel so strongly about, because if you have not come to school with all of the experience that will make you this strategic reader with the instincts and abilities that we've talked about, if you do not come to school with all of that in your pocket, as it were, then somebody's got to teach you it and can't wait until you come to the end of the decoding journey. It's got to happen 
from the very, very earliest. If we think about being wrapped up and being read to and being talked to, that's what has to happen. That listening comprehension, that focus on comprehension is really significant as, as the, you know, we talk about from the national curriculum, the two dimensions, they run together. question is if I don't come to school with these strategies in my pocket who does something about it yeah we do something about it and when I talked at the very beginning about teaching reading is complex uh, th this is where the complexity I suppose really lies um, as, I, as I said I think we've all received a lot of training and information about Te the teaching of phonics as the strategy for um, teaching children to decode texts and we know the evidence behind that is absolutely secure but the evidence behind teaching reading comprehension is 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 very very compelling too so in talking about how we explicitly teach reading comprehension I am definitely singing out in you know, all of the evidence that that is behind this is is really incredibly significant. And if we think about all of those missing parts from those children who came to us just without that wealth of experience, then as, as I've said, it's 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 us that do something about it. But this for me has always been the most the most complex part. And if I come back to how I learned, how I, I grew to understand this and and understand the evidence, it's all self-taught. It's all done in here, actually, with fabric in the, in the shed in the bottom of the garden. This is where I have developed my understanding and then my experience when I've been teaching in school. So the, the five key strategies there that we we need to explicitly teach. And as Professor Jane O'Kill um, said, I was just listening to a podcast with her and her words just, oh, they just absolutely resonated with me. She said, I feel very strongly about this. We teach reading comprehension from the very beginning. And so we teach reading comprehension whilst we're reading to children if they are unable to access the texts that we want to develop reading comprehension from they're unable to access that themselves which of course they will be in the very earliest days of their journey as a reader then then it's reading to them and we're teaching them and we're modeling to them how do we predict how how does prediction work and then the joy of a prediction when so you know we all love to make a prediction you know my husband and i will predict he's going to be the we're all he's going to be the murderer or whatever in a in it when you're watching whatever on tv we're all instinctively looking to make predictions but we need to teach that to children so let's teach them explicitly and model how to make predictions and then the joy if and when your predictions ah yes that's the way it worked going through that process numerous times looking for clues i talk to children about squeezing evidence from the text in order to give you the the most important tools to make a prediction so it's not plucked randomly we're using clues that were given so we teach model all of that that around the strategy of prediction we constantly encourage and develop the children's questioning. So again, you question from evidence within the text that is, is refined as the children go through that numerous times, that you teach children to expect to understand. So they should expect to seek to clarify their understanding within the text constantly, that you walk away from a text with a summary you must always do that that whether it be that you are reading a series of short stories or a longer novel or picture books or 
you, you you're sharing a picture book with a friend you expect to be able you that, that you know that you should walk away with the key points in your head that you can remember that you can remember the key points from a nursery rhyme you can remember the key points from the picture book you were read to at the end of the day that summarizing is modeled and taught consistently and then activating prior knowledge um so in our school we talk about link making so children make are taught and it is modeled to them how to link within texts how to link to wider texts and then to make links with the real world we look at it as a three sort of stepped process so we're constantly looking for links as we're reading and as i'm reading to children i might just pause and say Do you know i've just made a link wow it just reminds me of something i watched on tv or it's this really links with the book that we read right back at the beginning of term if we um, started by reading daniel pennack's the eye of the wolf I can make a link with the wolf on that day when the boy looked into his eye. So I, I constantly model and expect the children to make those links. That's a really important strategy in terms of creating those mental models. So we are explicitly teaching these five strategies and we're breaking them down. So it might be that um, summarizing becomes be, or, or clarifying becomes um, looking for those those abil that ability to perhaps uh, illustrate a text and highlight key points from the text by uh, labeling it. So if I don't quite understand it, I could clarify it in in different ways and clarify it for 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 um, somebody else to see my understanding of the text. So we teach these explicitly. And uh, it might be that we teach them through reciprocal reading rules. In my school, we, we, we like that strategy for working. We use it whole class and in groups. There's so much evidence to support the, the, the reciprocal reading model. Um, and it works because children, I think that whole um, idea of taking on a role is is a, an exciting and powerful way to, to unlock the strategies for children. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we teach them those roles. And then ultimately what we want to do is to pick up a book with with the children and then take on those roles instinctively. So if we think about our children who perhaps have come to us without those experiences um, that we could have given them those which they perhaps might have looked at quizzically in their in their in their peers you know what what is what how are you getting this joy from reading ah that's how because when you make a prediction it's exciting to see if it's going to it's going to happen within the story or if you ask a question it's it's interesting to be able to answer it or actually, I should walk away with an understanding and a summary of what I've 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 um, I've read. So unlocking those reading comprehension strategies, and I've seen this so so many times in classes of children that I've taught, is so empowering to children. It's such a leveler. That sense of entitlement is something I want every single child in my class to have almost a bit of a shoulders back well i didn't understand it miss belton you know we need to go back through it because i want to understand it and i love that that's for me the leveler because if i can give every child those strategies which gives them a sense of expectation when they pick up a book then I've given them something lifelong. I've given them something that opens the door to read to learn, which is ultimately where I want them to be, that they've learned to read. And within learning to read, they've also developed an expectation of what they're going to read. And from that, they'll pick up a book and they'll learn from it or they'll pick up a complex text in secondary school in their science lesson or in their their um, history lesson and be able to 
use these strategies to fully understand it. So for me, these are the great levelers, these strategies, these tools that we give to children. If we go right, right back there to perhaps the unfairness of that, the, what those experiences, those early literacy experiences have given children, the unfairness can be leveled out through these strategies. Um, yeah. So I've obviously given you the very briefest um, introduction to reading comprehension strategies. It's one to really unpack and to continue to understand further, most definitely. Um, but I wanted to conclude in terms of that explicit teaching of reading comprehension strategies with a really important message, actually, um, that it once the, those strategies have been taught explicitly. It's, it's so important that we step back, having taught them, step back and, and watch as the children employ the strategies instinctively without us having to prompt them. Um, so one of my most joyous experiences as a teacher is is, is watching my year six class um, organize themselves ready for a short story reading without me saying a word in terms of their reading comprehension. They already have their notebook, they have it sectioned up. Some of the children will actually come to school in the morning knowing that we're going to be reading a particular book in English and will already have done this. So they've got their questions section, they've got their uh, summary all ready to be a section in their notebook, all ready to record their summary. They already in their notebook have a summary, have a, a, a section to record areas they'd like to clarify. So that stepping away as we watch and then prompt with some children where appropriate but that understanding that release from those prompts and those scaffolds I think is really important to celebrate and to understand is, is perhaps the most important part of the process that it becomes an instinct with the children and they can employ that instinctively it, it, in anything they meet. And that's the joy when you when you open a reading record and there's some notes in there about, oh yeah, I was the link maker at, at home today because I spotted some links between what we were watching on TV and what I've been reading in class. So that that release of the scaffold, I think, is, is a really important one to consider as well. Um, but then just to say finally that I hope I've, I've stressed within that those strategies and that ability to comprehend, that ability to read is definitely um, something that I'm using my C <laughs> analogy floating on a C uh, throughout the, the presentation too, but it, it, it's about talk. It's about talk about books and it's not just about talk about books. It's about talk within everyday activities that we're doing. And um, that I, you, you, we know children's learning is, is happening at home right now. And just I just wanted to sort of end with some resources that we're making to support that home literacy environment in the hope not that you, you, the, the, these are, are to come through you as teachers, um, that they're not um, resources that parents I would expect to access from our website, but I would absolutely love to think that teachers would would look, would read, and would do, would use them as they're talking to families about how home learning's going. And in my experience, the challenges of that. I live really close to my catchment area from my school, and I meet numerous families on my walk who talk about the real challenges of sitting at a table and working. And I constantly talk about the importance of reading and the importance of talk. They are the things I think that if, if nothing else can happen at home, and for many families, there are lots of days for whom that's the reality. Very little can really happen. But if nothing else can happen, 
just a, a bit of time to interact and a, a bit of time to read could be so important and, and so powerful. So just to finish my little um, presentation by a bit of a sales pitch, really, um, they're there, they're on our website. Um, the trust framework is taken from the 10 prompts in the Preparing for Literacy Guidance Report, uh, the 10 prompts for sustained shared thinking. Whilst it's in the Preparing for Literacy Guidance Report, I think it's it's in absol it's absolutely applicable across primary and, and actually perhaps wider than that. Um, but they're just key prompts to support talk when undertaking tasks like in the second example the comic strip making fish fingers and smiley faces for tea or key prompts for for when families are, are reading something together at home so that's my little bit of a sales pitch at the end um yeah um just to end by saying thank you very much for listening thank you very much for for, for accessing this it's exciting I've never done anything like this before um, and just to say that my um, my email address is there and if anybody wanted to discuss anything further I would love to hear from you okay so thank you again it's very much appreciated that you you listened <laughs>